From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Some residents near Ennis Lake complaining about the expansion of a nearby gravel pit license. Why they say the pit should not grow coming up at 632. I'm Joe St. George on Capitol Hill. The economy and inflation certainly driving voters to the polls, but threats to democracy is emerging as a top issue as well. We look at the push to protect the results next. Happy Monday, Southwest Montana, and happy Halloween. It is 6.30. Chet Lehman, Matt Elwood with you here. A lovely morning on this final day of yeah. October. Uh, certainly has been worse than years past, but not bad out there right now. <laughs> no, though. I think all in all, uh, I mean, the kids are going to go out no matter what. Uh, rain, uh, may shine, not be quite yeah. cold, whatever. Uh, it just depends on how long they'll go out. Exactly. I think tonight uh, they'll be out for a while. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be pretty comfortable. Nice. The morning good. temperatures into the 30s and 40s. Not a lot of frost on the pumpkins as we're starting the morning. We do have a little bit of cloud cover trying to make its way back through. Here's a look at our daytime forecast with our day planner. Uh, mid 50s for the afternoon. It looks like partly cloudy skies. Temperatures will drop pretty quickly tonight, but I do expect us to be into the 40s at um, as we get into that seven o'clock hour. We're going to talk more in depth about that school day forecast and much more in just a little bit. Thank you, Matt. 631 North entrance to Yellowstone National Park already open to general traffic. In an announcement yesterday, park officials said the final work on the road, the painting of uh, road stripes completed on Saturday that allowed the road to open ahead of schedule. You can see the paint striping vehicle here uh, as it headed up the road on Saturday. Uh, as recently as Saturday, park said the road would not open until Tuesday at eight o'clock in the morning. Yellowstone officials say the new road opens with some cautionary warnings. Road contains steep grades, sharp curves, speed limits range from 15 to 25 miles per hour. There are no length or weight restrictions, but oversized vehicles or those pulling trailers must use caution on the curves. Road construction work will continue and may cause short delays along the route. The east, south and west entrances to the park due to close Tuesday morning. That's a routine seasonal closing to allow snow to build up before the winter reopening to over snow vehicles, which usually occurs about December 15th. In other news this morning, uh, air and water quality. Those are the concerns some residents of Ennis have over the expansion of a gravel pit north of town. Tans Jolie Salee has the story. I'm here on a piece of property in McAllister near Ennis, overlooking Lake Ennis that connects to the Madison River. A beautiful view that residents say will soon be obstructed by the expansion of a gravel mine and an asphalt pit right behind me. This is the only little area in the purple yeah. that we're actually going to mine. I don't know why they've decided to make it bigger or what, what's going on there. The DNRC owns a 160-acre lot of land on the east side of Highway 287, which is the site of a gravel pit owned and operated by AM Wells. The pit has been on this land for 30 years, leased to them by the DNRC. Tim Hokinson, the owner of AM Wells, says they're expanding the pit because it's outgrowing the boundary of their original permit. But our actual expansion is only an extra eight acres. I mean, I know I've heard that it's expanded by over 50 percent. Hokinson said he's heard a lot of misinformation information on the gravel pit. They're talking about bringing in an asphalt plant. There's not an asphalt plant in there now. The reason we left it in the permit is because, you know, if they're going to redo the road right outside of there, it's way cost effective if uh, they can get the stuff locally. On the other side of this fence is a lot of land owned by a man who also owns Valley Garden Ranch right down the road. He chose to not be interviewed for this story, but he recently filed a lawsuit against the DEQ, claiming that the environmental assessments by the DEQ and DNRC were performed after the permit was issued to AM Wells. He also claims that residents weren't properly notified about the expansion of the pit. But Hokinson and the DNRC say they did take the proper steps before deciding to expand the pit. Public notice went in the paper. There was no, no issues. Due to ongoing litigation, the DEQ was not willing to make a comment, but the DNRC says this about the gravel pit. We have literally hundreds of gravel pits on state lands throughout the state of Montana. You know, if they're done right, uh, they really don't cause any problem. But John Malovich, the executive director for the Madison River Foundation, disagrees. Currently, there's uh, a bluff or a wall that's made of gravel and dirt that protects the overall view, but also protects the ability for runoff to go directly into the Madison, into the tributaries. AM Wells has been permitted to eliminate this barrier. Two thirds of that east wall has been exposed for the last 25 years. So I don't know why another 500 or 1,000 foot of that is going to change it. 
spilling chemicals for the last 30 years and so it's still okay to do it today and tomorrow, that's the wrong attitude to take. Hokinson says any contamination would be extremely minimal in his opinion. I mean, we are required by the DEQ to minimize the dust, so we use, you know, water uh, control. And there's monitoring wells up there to monitor groundwater. The DNRC has posted a draft of their environmental assessment on their website that is out for public comment until November 25th. In Ennis, Jolie Salee, MTN News. Of course, a story we're going to continue to follow here on Montana this morning. Meantime, 635 tomorrow, one week until Election Day. And as the candidates begin their final push for votes, a separate effort is happening behind the scenes to protect the outcome and the results. Our Joe St. George looks at the fight from law enforcement, lawyers and election leaders to make sure the results are believed come election night. If you haven't voted yet, you soon will, and while in every election there are important races, this year protecting the integrity of the vote has become just as important. We've seen things around the country. Meet Craig Latimer, the supervisor of elections in Hillsborough County, Florida. He's part of a new nationwide group called the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections, which throughout this year has been working across the country to prevent worst case scenarios from happening. It's in, you know, imperative to me that we have those relationships with our local law enforcement. Latimer says local law enforcement in the U.S. are more prepared this year to handle issues such as voter intimidation, inappropriate poll watching, and threats to election workers. He says the truth is in years past, many officers may have been unaware of their role. 20 years ago when I was in law enforcement, I had no idea some of the election laws that I would have been expected to enforce. The improved cooperation is already evident in Maricopa County, Arizona, where accusations of voter intimidations have occurred after individuals began watching ballot drop boxes. Local Sheriff Paul Penzone, who is also a member of the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections, has deployed officers to protect locations. We will be present in as many places as we can. The effort to protect the vote isn't just a local one. The Department of Homeland Security, as well as the FBI and the Department of Justice, have devoted more resources to track threats from in and outside the U.S. in the coming days. This hotline number you can see on your screen has been set up for anyone to call. FBI agents have been instructed to thoroughly investigate complaints. We have four lawyers here. And then there is the legal fight brewing on both sides. More than 100 lawsuits have already been filed ahead of the midterms across the U.S., targeting everything from early voting to voter access. Thar Hasibola runs the ACLU of Nevada. He says in battleground states like his, civil liberty groups have recruited dozens of lawyers to be on the ready to head to court should any controversies arise through Election Day. It seems to be that courts are the last stand, and democracy-based lawyering right now is becoming more of a critical focus, I think. In Washington, I'm Joe St. George. All right, 638, a group of black women recently back from a trip of a lifetime sharing the experience to inspire others. They appeared recently on CBS Mornings to talk about making it to the summit of the largest freestanding mountain in the world. CBS's Michael George has the story. Good job. They call themselves Sisters to the Summit. And earlier this month, they reached the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, Africa, an expedition five years in the making. We want to see the world, and we want to discover places and take ourselves out of our comfort zones. We all had to find our ways to train, so whether it was on the treadmill, doing small hikes in New Jersey, or going in Harlem. Twelve women made it to the peak, one of the largest groups of black Americans ever to do so. But two others did have to turn back because of altitude sickness. I kept throwing up. I was really weak. My oxygenation went down to 56. Mm. Mm. And it's supposed to be at least 100. 100, yeah. All 14 women shared their story on CBS Mornings. They say they were able to reach their goal thanks to help from personal porters. Our snacks, our first aid, everything went with our personal porters. So somebody's carrying it. Mm -hmm. Someone's carrying it, which was very unique on the mountain because everybody who is climbing the mountain, they're in it, salt of the earth kind of people, granola, and we were the only group, <laughs> we were the only group that had someone walking beside us carrying our backpack. How many porters did you have? 72. 72. <laughs> We made it. We made it to the summit. And while two weeks later, some of the women still can't feel their toes, a few are already thinking Antarctica will be their next adventure. Michael George, CBS News, New York. By the way, all 14 women said they made lifelong friendships on the journey. All but one said they would not make that journey again with their spouse or significant other. Very, very interesting. 640. We're going to take a break when we.